Hello, my name is Greg Madison, and welcome to this episode of The Living Process. Today, my guest is Leslie Ellis, and she is a doctor of psychology living on the west coast of British Columbia. And her initial training is in uh, Jungian analysis. And she then went on to train in focusing, but especially trauma-informed focusing with Shirley Turcott in Canada. And we speak a little bit about that experience. And then we go on and talk about her specialization that she's been developing now for quite a few years in working with dreams in an experiential manner. And we talk about how to retell the dream from the inside, how to get help from the dream, how to allow the dream to carry itself forward, and some of the specifics about her way of working with dreams, which is informed, of course, by Eugene Gendlin's earlier book, Let Your Body Interpret Your Dreams. But Leslie has expanded upon that in many ways and also offers in her own book uh, some of the broader context around dream research, which is fascinating to read. So I hope that you enjoy this. I found it a very inspiring talk, and it's made me uh, very interested in dreams all over again. So I hope it encourages you to work with your own dreams, and if you work with clients, perhaps to inquire more into their own dream lives. Thanks very much. Here it is, The Living Process, and our episode with Dr. Leslie Ellis. Welcome to Leslie. And this is an episode that's probably going to concentrate mostly on dreams. But before we get into that, um, I'd love to hear, I imagine you've had to tell this story a thousand times. So maybe if there's a new way that you want to tell it about just how you got into focusing. Um, yeah, you know, no, I haven't been asked that question for a while, so um, I'm happy to jump in. I was first introduced by a very dear friend uh, who had found focusing as a way to process some very significant trauma that she experienced. And so she introduced me to uh, Shirley Turcott, who is a um, Aboriginal focused uh, focusing teacher. And <clears throat> I was at the time I was studying for my, my master's in counseling at Pacifica Graduate Institute. So I was studying Jungian oriented therapy and, and absolutely loving it. And then right when I finished and was about to start my counseling career, I had been a journalist and I was, it was a big shift for me. Yeah. I got pregnant with my lovely daughter, Grace, and I couldn't really launch into my career uh, at that point. So I thought, well, I'll just keep my mind in in it and i'll i'll learn focusing i'll take i took shirley's two-year uh focusing um oriented therapy training and you know well this baby was growing in my belly it was very interesting um process actually trying to clear space when you have something living inside you i really couldn't actually grace and then actually got you know she was born during the process of my training so she got handed around through this whole group of beautiful women and um, at the end, Shirley presented everyone with a, a, a beautiful Aboriginal print, and mine was different. Mine was unique because it had a pregnant woman sitting under a tree. Um, so that that was my introduction to focusing. Nice. So was there something in the body work that kind of spoke to you, or what was it specifically about focusing that made it worth doing a training in? Um, you know, I, I, I very much have had a rich inner life all my, since as long as I can remember, I've been kind of a loner and kind of a daydreamer. So having a, um, you know, just a, a dialogue, an inner dialogue was very, you know, familiar to me, but bringing the body in was a, a step that I felt like 
was really important for for my um, ability to stay kind of present and grounded because I could drift away quite easily. And I was also encountering in my, you know, it, it seems like when you first start your career as a therapist, they throw you right into the fire. You get the, I think I've faced some of my most difficult cases right at the start. And yeah. I really didn't know how necessarily to help them through talking. It didn't feel like enough, honestly. It felt like a lot of their trauma uh, was implicit. And I, you know, I, I really didn't feel like, even though I got excellent tools, I have to say my training was excellent. Uh, this piece about um, implicit trauma and early trauma was um, just a critical one. It really added something that I needed to help with those really early places or those wordless places and I really um, credit Shirley for teaching me how to listen um, in more intuitively and more into the body in a much larger sense the body in terms of the history of the body and the person's um, whole story going back generations there you know her focus isn't so much present life it's it's a much larger perspective and I was really grateful to have that brought in it really helped me to help others and you helped me with my own story too. I had a um, sort of a rough start in life. I was born uh, very premature and was, you know, put in a lonely incubator for, you know, about six weeks. And so I had this, I think that's where I got my initial um, desire to always um, kind of go in. I think I had to sort of figure some things out early on that I didn't really have words for. So. Focusing gave me a language for some very deep, important things for myself and the people I worked with. That's a very um, specific way to start one's existence. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. It immediately makes me wonder what that's like. Um, but one of the questions I have, do you actually teach groups focusing, focusing oriented therapy or... I do. Um, I, it's been it's been a, a whole journey. I did for about 10 years or more. I taught like a two year focusing oriented therapy uh, certification program. Mm -hmm. And then I started uh, recently doing an um, uh, integrative program with Jan Winhall and Serge Pringle. So I teach dream work in that um, as a as a sort of a we do modules and I teach dream work. And Serge teaches his uh, group methods, and um, he's very masterful at group process. And then Jan teaches the trauma and addiction piece. So mm -hmm. I've been mostly now focusing on uh, dreams. But I've also, it's interesting because I teach with the Jung platform, and they've invited me to teach purely focusing <laughs> as part of my teaching on the Jung platform. So even though they're very much interested in dream work they i've i've married focusing with dream work and i find them they work beautifully together but they they just got so intrigued about the focusing itself that um now i'm i'm offering um uh, focusing uh for the young Jungian community which is really kind of a nice twist <laughs> yeah it seems like the body has kind of arrived on the map of psychotherapy finally in in some yes. way yes <laughs> yeah. it's become uh yeah the sort of the latest and yeah. you know catch um not just a catch word it's actually really genuinely been picked up by people who have well i think encountered the same thing that i did which is that there's only so much you can do with words and the body has got so much um more to say or there's there's a way that it has to be implicated in the healing process or it's or it's not deep enough, it just stays on the surface. Yeah, definitely. Um, the reason I asked if you're teaching is um, I often have a question when I first do, like just do an introduction to focusing or focusing oriented therapy. Someone always asks about trauma. And I'm curious how you answer that question. If it's somebody that's new to focusing, they're new to kind of bringing their awareness into their body and they immediately think this is scary or dangerous or something and they think about trauma how do you answer that um hmm, 
that's a big question. Uh, well, I, I generally, when I first introduce focusing, I do um, introduce uh, safety um, ideas of resourcing. Mm -hmm. I do think that when people have had significant trauma, um, that going inward can feel unsafe. And so I address it right at the get-go, even though it's more, more of an advanced skill, it feels like you can't invite someone inward without having that conversation about there could be, uh, you know, um, memories or uh, feelings or sensations you encounter that are uncomfortable. And so I, I teach right away that it's, your body actually has some inherent safety uh, mechanisms built in. And there's a reason that you might decide, to, your body might just decide to take you right out of there. And it's not a bad thing. It's, it's a, it's a um, we have these very um, inherent, well-developed uh, uh, ways to titrate and to, you know, feather our way in. And so I talk about those and say, we can just learn those deliberately, ways to find a comfortable distance. And mm -hmm. I teach people how to develop the ability to observe uh, from a, a distance, from a, a little bit further out, so that there's a, a way to stay present and observe and find uh, what's comfortable. But I never, I never stop people from going in, you know, because I don't want them to get the idea that this is a dangerous place or that it's somehow too much for certain people, because that's absolutely not true. I feel like that is the way forward. Uh, yeah. It's just that it has to feel uh, like it's a way forward that that isn't too much at once. And I think the first time people do focusing, they they're just a little unguarded, and they'll go right into the deep end sometimes. And so I try to prepare them for that. But once they've kind of dipped a toe in and realized, oh my goodness, this is a powerful route to um, everything that's in there. So they're automatically then more. Um, cautious or they go at an appropriate pace. But I do caution that the first time people are just not ex expecting that it can get so deep so quickly. Yeah. So all of that, I say all of yeah. that. that. I mean, I like the way you've said that because it, it is kind of like jumping ahead and giving some markers or something that's a little bit more sophisticated, but having that even as you're just beginning, because the, the practice can seem so simple. Yes. And yet it can be so, as soon as you, you know, close your eyes, bring that attention inside, it can be really surprising that, wow, there's something there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And often something that's been waiting for a long time, so might speak quite loudly. Finally, yeah. you're yeah, here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm curious, the main, the main topic uh, and one of the main reasons that I wanted to talk to you is about dreams. Yes. And I'm curious how you, how you got in, is it, is it personal? Did you, you kind of, were you fascinated by your own dreams and decided to get more into it or how did it happen? I've always been fascinated by dreams and by kind of the unseen realm and the, you know, that, that whole world of, of imagination and I, I honestly lament that as children you know we do, we just have a, a relationship with imagination where it is more real to us and that somewhere along the way that sense of wonder gets um quashed and dreaming to me is is a way to reignite that sense of wonder and a sense that there is something larger and and you know outside of ourselves that is in a way magical and so i have always had this this interest in that um imaginal realm and my dreams i'm a big daydreamer so i've spent a lot of time just kind of uh, in this active imagination process before i had a word for it and i've been interested in my dreams they've they've been something i've always written down and i've always paid attention to but I didn't really get into dream work professionally until I, I did my master's in counseling at Pacifica. And I'd, I'd been seeing a Jungian therapist, so I'd been, you know, talking about my dreams and, and drawing my dreams. And my dreams were, uh, I had a whole series of dreams 
you know, speaking about my um, uh, difficult start in life or my interesting start in life, I had a whole series of dreams about about that, about being um, in an incubator, about being, I had some near-death experiences that got, they got mixed in with, with that. And some of the most amazing uh, processes I had in my own course of therapy and my own training, which included some practice, was via my dreams. Mm-hmm. My dreams gave me images for experiences that I would not have had access to otherwise. So I feel like as a therapist, they're just an amazing resource that I, you know, if I didn't have dreams to refer to or, or dream like um, dream like sequences, because you can, you can also create waking dreams that will, that will um, take you to the same terrain and not everybody recalls their dreams. So I do think of daydreaming and waking dreaming as another route in, but without that, I just feel like there's so much uh, really deep, important material that doesn't get talked about and dreams bring up, you know, the difficult or the hidden or the repressed or the things we avoid or the memories that are inaccessible. And they do so uh, with images so that that we have something to hold on to that we can work with because a lot of the material can't be worked with directly, but the dreams are very, um, very helpful at (laughs) giving us really startling and, and incredible creative strange images so that we have something to work with something that we can explore yeah just uh, out of curiosity when you started working with your dreams in Jungian analysis was that a different way of working with dreams or did you do it kind of similar to how you ended up developing dream work you know it was very similar because the person that i worked with um that i think of as a, sort of the most profound dream work i did was with a, a man named john allen who really even though he wouldn't say he was doing focusing it was okay. <laughs> it really was it was the same kind of process um of you know and and there's added pieces in that um it was a definitely a process of felt sensing and letting the image speak but then layered onto it is these Jungian ideas of having dialogues with dream characters or or becoming them which I generally wrote about dreams as well and these these Jungian methods of embodying characters so you're taking um the felt sense a little bit further it's sort of uh, uh it's a hybrid of active imagination and focusing but I think without the ability to do focusing, these methods don't really work. They just don't. You have to have, have that ability to sense in in an authentic way and let it carry forward. And I think when people are are doing this process in a deep way, like 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 John was, that it isn't different from focusing. I would if you if you looked at a session, you would think that that's what he was trained in, honestly. Um, and I know focusing is not, it's, it's, it's a process gentleman found and described in a way that anyone can find, but other people have found it via other ways. And so, yeah, yeah so I would say long winded way of saying, yeah, yes, it was very focusing oriented, my own um, dream journeys. Mm-hmm. I want to ask one more kind of big general question, and then maybe some more kind of specific questions about how you work with dreams and uh, I I love working with dreams with with my clients. I not every session, but very often I ask my clients if they have, have any dreams. Um, mm-hmm. But I feel like I can learn a lot more about how to work with dreams. So I want to ask some of the specifics. But before that, um, when you talk about the Jungian way of working with dreams, it reminds me of something that Jendlin. Uh, wrote at some place, maybe in the dream book, where he talks about the dream as coming from the big system. Mm. And that sort of reminds me of some of the Jungian archetypes and sort of, this is my sense of it at least, some of that, um, that indication that what comes in the dream may not just be personal or personal 
symbols that in some way we may be gathering up something more than just our biography. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Mm -hmm. I have this whole, um, in my dream courses, I have this whole section I do um, on, I call it the dream divide. And it's this idea that you, you, you presented, the dream comes to you and there's a, I think there's a mostly a, a tendency to look at the personal associations and what this means for me and my life. And then I think, you know, more um, older cultures, traditional cultures tend to look at the dreams as transpersonal, as collective, as <clears throat> the dream doesn't belong to the person, the dream belongs to the community or to humanity. And so mm -hmm. I talk about this because you, you can, see that if you go down one way, you're going further away from the, the other way. So I, um, I think all dreams have at least some of the bigger, um, the bigger realm, the arch archetypal realm, or however you want to phrase it, this transpersonal realm, that all dreams um, have something that's universal in them. And in fact, if you want the dream to enlarge you as a person, if you look only for personal associations and how this is related to your, your daily life and what kind of psychological development you can glean from it, you're missing the chance to expand your consciousness and expand the way that you um, interact with the world. So I like to start with the bigger, um, the bigger picture and just to feel into the dream as if it's a work of art or a, a gift from God or however you think of, of, of that larger realm mm -hmm. and, and just let it be its own autonomous thing that we relate to in a way by experiencing it. And that doesn't require interpretation. It's very different from the way, um, you know, if you want to interpret or figure out or make meaning, it isn't about that. It's actually an encounter. Like mm -hmm. encountering, I think of it like encountering a wild animal, something that's other and majestic and has this way of moving inside you, but isn't you. And I feel like that's almost a bigger gift from dreams. And they do illuminate our personal lives and situations beautifully and importantly in, in, in a lot of cases, but the, the um, ability for dreams to enlarge our consciousness, I think is even more important. And I love so, that. Yeah, I, I love that. It's, <clears throat> it's almost as though the, the dream has its own autonomous existence in some way, and we're invited to share that. Um, yeah. That it feels like that brings a, a more profound depth to it. Uh, sometimes I have clients that will present a dream and they will say, that's not really about anything, or I guess that's self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very <laughs> common. You're kind of going flat. Mm -hmm. it's like, so I'm now I'm curious, how, how do you work with dreams? Do you have a, a kind of a a set, not a set format, because I'm sure it's very different with every single person you encounter, but do you have a any kind of general way of working with dreams? I do, yeah. I have a, um, a, a fairly systematic approach that, of course, then can be um, altered depending on the dream, but I, I start by inviting the person to tell the dream from inside the dream, so meaning that if you have a dream, you, you know, you don't just read the words on your journal, although you could do that to just to, to bring it back into your memory and bring back details. It's good mm -hmm. to read what you've written first, but then put that aside and go into the dreamscape. And in this way, you can only work with dreams that are um, what uh, my friend uh, Robbie Bosnick calls living dreams. He's a Jungian, a Dutch Jungian analyst who works with dreams in very much a focusing oriented way. Although he he didn't take focusing training either, he does exactly that. So it's really funny. But he, he, he I agree with him that the dream has to feel alive. So you need to be able to go um, into the dream in your memory and in in your body, and have it still be there, not just your memory of the you know oh it was there was a tree and a person person, but you could actually see the dreamscape again 
and walk into the dream. So I invite people to tell it from first person, from uh, present tense, as though they're dreaming it again. And what happens is really interesting because lots of things come in the in that process that weren't written down. They remember things that weren't even necessarily noted. They'll see new things. The dreams actually change. I believe they change. They're a living thing that changes even when we're not engaging with them. So they might be slightly different than what you remember. And I, I don't feel like the written text of a dream is, is really sacred or that that's how the dream is now because they evolve. And so I basically have people walk through the dream and really just describe their current experience of it. And especially the um, starting with where it is because that deepens the experiential aspect of it. If you can engage with the place, with the weather, with the, the your, you know, the smell, the sounds, all of the senses. Mm -hmm. So immersing into this dreamscape and looking around. And so, and then what I do, and this is an idea from Jenlin, which I've picked up and I really love, is the idea of finding help in a dream. So looking for the um, resources because dreams, mostly or very often present challenging, um, something challenging, something that's at the edge of our consciousness that, that wants in or feels a bit difficult. This is why people dismiss their dreams. I think it's, you know, when they say, oh, it's nothing, it's really <laughs> because it's something and some part of them knows that and doesn't really want to go there. So yeah. I invite them to um, look around for anything that feels nurturing and to embody the felt sense of that um, and there could be many things and if the if the dream material feels particularly challenging i invite them to to pick up as many um, resources or helpful um, places that they can so that uh, they will be more able to stay with what the dream might be presenting that's challenging and it really works it's it's like the um this was from jen Lin as well the idea that the the um the help you need is in the dream itself and it's different from you know when you're working with trauma i know this is a a, a very important practice to be grounded and resourced and find your internal resources and i suggest people do that with nightmare work and especially if the dream doesn't have much help in it but mostly um, if the help can come from right within the dream it's much more potent and appropriate to the whatever the encounter is going to be so sometimes that process alone of walking into the dreamscape and re richly reimagining it and then finding what are helpful um, resources finding the felt sense of that carrying that is all that's needed uh Jenlin said that you know once you've done that you you've, you've gotten what what's really important to get from the dream and the rest is kind of like if you want but i don't usually stop there then i usually invite them armed with the you know the help that they have with them in their bodies to look at the images that might be most puzzling or most challenging or most they might be most curious about mm -hmm. and to have um either a dialogue with that image or if it's if they're um, if they're up for it, it's really powerful to enter into the subjective experience of the image, because I think we get caught up in this idea that our our dream ego, the, the avatar of us in the dream, is equivalent to us and is really the central viewpoint and the main character and all of that. And I don't believe so, honestly. I think that is uh, potentially a representative of our persona or our ego consciousness or our um, you know image of ourself it's usually a kind of fumbling incompetent figure mm -hmm. that can't find their way it's always in trouble you know it's not necessarily the only place <laughs> to visit and not the most powerful place really uh, so i would invite people to embody other characters or elements that can be inanimate they can be embodying a place, uh, you know, uh, uh, an animal, whatever uh, kind of appeals to them. And as long as it feels okay to do that mm -hmm. and 
from the inside of other dream elements, there's a whole nother take on the dream. Like it, it really does expand a person. And um, there, this is this is specifically how Robert Bosnick works. Actually, this is all he does with the dream: is have people embody different aspects of the dream and pick up the felt sense of that and gather up several felt senses at once and hold them all and explode or, you know, so it's, um, it's quite an intense process the way he does it. And that isn't how I do it, but um, it is, um, I've taken, I studied with him and it's interesting because he's very uh, masterful at helping people really get inside of dream elements and not to decipher them or to um, take them on as like a gestalt idea. It's not like, oh, this is an aspect of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of hubris to think that all of these characters are, you know, sh shards of us that goes against the idea that these are actually universal transpersonal forces. But if we feel into them, um, there's a way that the the puzzle of the dream, if there's a, if there's a mystery or a, why am I dreaming about this? Or how, why is this here? A lot of those questions just become clear mm -hmm. uh, from that in, internal experience of, of other places in the dream. And there isn't a lot in the way I work of interpretation. It's really more experiencing and letting that insights will drop in after that. But I think of them as a, a byproduct and not the goal. Um, so I will find help and then invite people to embody different elements of the dream. And the other part is from Jung, uh, Jungian psychology, which is to dream the dream onward or active imagination. And we're already kind of dreaming it onward when we do these things like enter the dream and, and become different characters or talk to them. But then there might be a natural desire for the dream to continue or for something to shift. Uh, the biggest uh, shifts I see are that people might initially be afraid in some way that of whatever's happening in the dream, or it might be kind of a dire situation. And yet when people can feel resourced and go into the dream with company and with curiosity, uh, it's like our, you know, how our, our perception of things is very state dependent. So when people feel a little more curious and open to what the dream is bringing, the dream itself changes. Something that was dead comes to life. Mm -hmm. Things like that happen very often. And the dream itself is a different dream. And it needs no interpretation. It, it, is, it has changed. And that is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Let me just say that back to you because that's fascinating. I was just kind of imagining it as I was listening to you. That in the dream, if you get the help in the dream, you get that kind of energy from the dream. And you look then at different aspects of the dream, some of which may have been troubling. They can come alive in a fresh way because having embodied that other energy, you now are different somehow. Yes. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yes. yes, and it happens really fluidly. Uh, mm -hmm. An example I like to give um, is one of um, a person who uh, just wanted to try this method and is happy for me to share it. And she was um, in, in the dream, she was in Dublin, uh, which is her hometown. And she, uh, there's a bunch of things that happen uh, in the dream, but one of the most significant things is that um, she, um, actually, I'm going to think, I think I'm going to use a different example because it's a better one. I'm thinking that one is, a, a, there's a lot in that and I, I, I might, might get the details wrong, but th this one, she's, um, she's being uh, prepped for surgery and it's kind of not clear whether she really wants this or whether it's being forced upon her. There's a little ambiguity, a little tension. It's not like a terrifying nightmare, but it doesn't feel good either. And um, she's on like a balance beam and they say like, okay, take the snakes from her wrists. And, uh, and the, um, they take one away and then the other one, I think it gloms onto her leg or something like that. And uh, the surgeon is albino. 
and kind of an ambiguous figure. And so the the really magical part of this dream work process is, is um, we, we walk through the dream and we do pick up resources. And then I ask her to embody the surgeon. And the, the instant she does that, this um, surgical room uh, gets flooded with light. It just becomes incredibly different, incredibly spiritual. Suddenly, the whole thing is it just infused with light. And the, um, the surgery, uh, it's like she, I think she decides to keep the snake. Uh, but what happens is just the whole, the whole dream is a different thing. And the conversation shifts to her uh, neglected spiritual life. And the, that just is, she starts to go off on this, you know, just a track about how this dream is really, it felt important, but she had no way to decipher it. And this wasn't a figuring out, this was an experiencing of this ambiguous character as, um, oh my goodness, this is a, this is a richly spiritual experience that infused the entire dream and her with light and her face was lit up and and it was it was an experience that wasn't really you couldn't say that it logically went from there to there it just it just and it she didn't have necessarily great words for it she just went oh my goodness this is a call and uh, i've been neglecting this and this um and it it wouldn't have happened by itself is the other thing that i find interesting because I do think dreams are trying to yeah. engender these kinds of experiences, but I don't know if it's because we resist them or because they require some extra attention. I know Jenlin said, you know, he felt that if you didn't actually do some focusing and experiencing with your dreams, you weren't getting what they were bringing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we do get something, but not as powerfully or not as consciously as it if we uh, really um, go into the dreams and al allow them to work on us. I think of them as working on us <laughs> versus us yeah. working on them. Because sometimes you could wake up in the morning and sort of half remember a dream, but you carry the mood of it with you during the day. And it's you can feel there's something is happening in there and your way of interacting all day long is a bit different because something's infiltrated you to some extent, even if you don't remember much of the detail. Yes, they can bring a felt sense without a, without a memory. They can be a felt sense. A dream can be, um, you know, um, sometimes not really a, 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 like a story like movie. I yeah. think those, I think we tend to make stories out of them because of our, our tendency to turn things into narrative. But I don't think dreams are, they, I don't think they come that way. I think they come all of a piece and they they're an immersive experience kind of a, a world unto themselves mm -hmm. and we make a story because that's how we you know only way to really record and communicate them but i think images and and felt senses and and uh uh pictures are are, are better uh, actually at conveying a dream image mm -hmm. that's that i i always feel like there's you know, it's inadequate. Our description of our dreams, our retelling, our remembering of them, all of it is kind of um, doesn't it? What well, it gets a it gets at it, but it doesn't encapsulate or capture it, the whole thing. Yeah, it all just kind of points it. at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some specific questions I wanted to ask, but before that, I'm just getting a sense. You know, when you talk about working with clients that somehow it sounds like your clients, I don't know if they pick it up from you or if you do some kind of prep work to encourage it, but they seem to be really interested in their dreams and curious and willing to honor them or willing to go into the inner workings of them or something. And I'm wondering, do you have a way of encouraging that or do they just get it from you and your interest in their dreams? Um, it varies. It, it, some people come to me specifically because they have dreams or nightmares, and some will just um, start with focusing or bring a dream. And once they have an experience of 
how um, amazing it can be, then they bring more and they bec that becomes their preferred way of working. Mostly now though, I, I, I see very few clients. I'm mostly teaching therapists how to work with dreams uh -huh. and the therapists that are interested in working with dreams. And we do dream work as part of the training, quite a lot of it. Uh, they are already coming with that interest and curiosity. A lot of them already do work with dreams, but they don't work in this experiential embodied way. Uh, it's it's a process of unlearning for a lot of them uh, that, you know, there is such a tendency to want to pin it down and find the answer and analyze it. And I know that, that there's a, a great and rich history of that. And uh, I don't want to discount it, except that I feel like that uh, delimits it and it in in Jungian terms, the, you know the, the kind of method I've studied most. It, there's a, a a sort of a symbology and a language that comes with that approach that may or may not um, speak to uh, somebody's dream. I, I feel like that approach is now dated. Is now uh, and particularly around gender lines and. Anima, animus, but all of those things that, you know, these characters equal that. And I don't feel like dreams are ever can be pinned down in, in those terms. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, yeah, so most of the people that come to me uh, are already kind of on that path. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are not, um, they do focusing and they start to have an imaginal life it may or may not be dream work but it is it is imaginal work it's it, it, that that's just how i work so mm -hmm. if um if they don't love it <laughs> they don't stay but mostly they just start to um their 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 imaginal um life starts to just speak to them it becomes much more alive and they feel excited when they have yeah. a dream to yeah yeah um when you mention teaching therapists when i teach therapists i uh, i encounter i don't usually specifically teach dream works but i ask i always ask do you work with dreams mm -hmm. and the vast majority majority of therapists that i speak to they will say they they're open to hearing a client's dream but that's they will just hear the dream and then right away move on. They don't have any, I don't know if it's that they don't have any way of working with dreams or if they feel like they don't, they need some extra confidence or something. Do you ever encounter that? And if you do, do you, do you have any way of kind of encouraging maybe like young therapists, especially perhaps to kind of hang out with dreams in a in a way that they don't have to do anything necessarily, but they at least honor them a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, that's actually the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is that dreaming and dream work has become more marginalized over time. Yeah. It's not necessarily part of the mainstream training. I feel like it's it's such a tragedy to not have it be part of a therapist's uh, repertoire and especially when a client brings a dream that feels big and important and you as the therapist can't entertain it it's a it's a it's it's sending them the message that you're not interested in their inner life it's really it's not just a neutral i think it's detrimental honestly mm -hmm. so i well partly I, I mean that's why i offer these courses because it, i don't i think that there is a gap in in the training and it seems like that's just widening. And but I also say, look, if even if you don't necessarily um, take the whole training or find your own method, although I recommend people do some training, but to start with, all you really need is the tools you've you've learned as a therapist, which is curiosity and openness, and you treat the dream like you would someone brought you a story about their life, their encounter at work or their partner, you you would encounter it and, you know, ask more questions and you, you can treat a dream exactly the same way. I think the problem is that people have gotten this idea 
you know, from, um, you know, complex approaches like Jungian approaches, Freudian approaches, where there's a specific method and you have to understand with Jung, you have to, have, you know, feel like you have to have read every myth and every story and every um, literature of all the world to to really um, flesh out the dream. And there's a there's this idea that there's a lot of special knowledge required and that you have to come up with the answer and people present dreams. They're always so um, I don't know, like they're they're mysterious and there's no way to say, oh, <laughs> well, that means, I mean, if you do that, then you're not really doing justice to the dream. I don't believe in universal meanings or symbol dictionaries, but I think that it's daunting when someone presents a dream and it's this bizarre scenario and the, the therapist is expecting that they have to make it all make sense. And maybe the client is too. Mm -hmm. And so I just say step back and treat it like any experience. And if you are going to ever find, you know, maybe there is a reason this dream came to this person, but they're the ones that are going to figure that out. You are never going to be the one to have the answer because you don't have their whole life experience inside you. Yeah. All you can do is invite them to experience the dream. And, and, and a really simple way to think about a dream is uh, this is from Ernest Hartman, who was a dream researcher as well as a dream therapist, is to think of them as an, a metaphor for the most salient emotion in your um, in you know in your experience at the time. So they're not going to be literal. The um, the the bizarre pictures are purely metaphorical, but they often carry an emotion and like a felt sense. They carry something like that's not simply anger or it's a it's a complex emotion that can best be pictured the way the dream pictures it. They're not trying to be, um, you know, difficult or obfuscate. It's this is the dream's best way of presenting this feeling situation. And so if you invite someone to just go into what does this feel like and get a felt sense of that image or that scenario, and see if that feels like it has anything to say to you, then you're doing beautiful dream work and you don't have to know the answer. You won't know, it'd be presumptuous. Mm -hmm. And uh, it opens up a lot from that simple idea of a metaphor for emotion. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I will say to start with. Yeah, that's it's wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's very encouraging and very uh, kind of, um, accentuating the adventure mm -hmm. and that it's an experience that like all experience if you pay attention to it it gives more experience yes and also what what initially appears frightening is usually only frightening because it feels other or mis or it's been it's been disavowed or or pushed away and if you turn toward it, like, like a felt sense, it's very similar to focusing this way, that the, um, very often if you turn toward the dragon, if it's a dragon in your dream, the dragon then suddenly becomes friendlier and you know, be, can become an ally. I have this one, <clears throat> um, had this incredible dragon dream and it was quite frightening, but over the course of, you know, engaging with this dragon it became um a, a true ally the the person came to love this dragon and had dragon images and, and you know they put in their house and just um um became sometimes the 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 energies that we maybe don't embody or might need more of show mm -hmm. up as characters in our dreams and when we can kind of, you know, really engage and embody that, it, f it fills out sort of our, you know, what Jung's, what Jungians would call our inferior function, it fills out all of the places that we haven't really developed. And they'll show up as shadow characters. But as you sort of develop a relationship with them, they become, they don't necessarily lose their strength or their fierceness, but they become your fierceness and your strength. Mm -hmm. Or you can, you know, um incorporate some of that i wouldn't say you you are it you know they're they're autonomous as well but um there's a way that um just engaging with um what at first feels daunting and i, I get, think this is true in life if you you know it, it 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 will always become 
easier to understand and more relational once you have an, an, a relationship and a curiosity about it. It feels less other. I was just going to ask you a little bit about working with nightmares, and I feel like you're touching on that now. Um, but I'm wondering about kind of the more extreme nightmares where someone wakes up in a sweat and there was just there something had happened in the dream that was absolutely terrifying is there a way because sometimes i kind of feel um it doesn't quite feel right necessarily to invite the person to engage with something that's that terrifying i'm wondering if there's a middle step or if you have a way of developing that relationship yeah um well there are different kinds of nightmares and the most extreme or difficult ones are when someone has unmetabolized trauma and you know post-traumatic stress symptoms and the nightmares are recurrent and part of that whole uh, symptom picture mm -hmm. and so when people have recurring nightmares one thing to look at is um, does it relate specifically to a trauma they've experienced that they remember and the closer the dream is to the what really happened uh the more replicative it is of the actual trauma the more it indicates that it's not been metabolized and it keeps repeating and this is uh, you know one of the classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress so uh in that case it doesn't mean that you don't engage with it but you you have this um clue that it's really it's not been um you know it's not been really worked through yeah. and the dream is trying to do that but what happens is the dreams are so uh physiologically arousing that the person wakes up and in the middle of the dream in the scariest place and then it repeats and it becomes its own like vicious cycle and so I feel like it's actually very important to work with those dreams mm -hmm. because otherwise they actually drive the post-traumatic stress, stress symptoms and it, it, they, they kind of build on each other. So the way to work with those dreams is uh, to, this is from Jung, um, the idea of dreaming the dream onward. And it has also become a very well-researched um, cognitive behavioral method called imagery rehearsal therapy uh, that they basically take the dream and imagine a new ending and so starting from and you can vary the level of exposure to the dream material if it's really uh, fresh and the trauma is really not metabolized what you do is enter the dream right at the end right where uh, it stops and sort of don't go into so much of the the trauma material but to say um because it often stops in the worst place and the person clearly has survived it and things did progress beyond that but they get stuck there and they also because the dreaming um so it's it's not you know completely understood what dreaming does but um it's implicated in consolidating our memories and and regulating emotion and so what the dreams are trying to do is i think the emotion is there to make us pay attention to something dream about it and then as we dream about it it gets it gets kind of distributed into the associative networks that would be our memories and when that doesn't happen like in post-traumatic stress then those memories don't feel like the past, they feel like the present. Exactly. And so this memory consolidation process is being stalled out because the person's waking up and their dream life isn't doing its job. So you wanna kickstart the process by letting the dream continue. And I've done this so many times and it's, it, it, it's, it's always worked for me. It's always made a difference where you imagine into, okay, the dream stopped here. For example, um, this one example that, um, uh, where a woman was, I did my um, doctoral research on this, so I have lots to say about it, but this woman was in a, um, in, in Congo, in Africa, and she was, uh, her father was part of a, um, uh, you know, a one faction, and she was being confronted by people from the other uh, tribe that was, they were kind of at war, and they thought she had 
information that was implicating them. And so they, they you know, they, they accosted her and she thought she was going to be shot. And her dream was always about that. And it always stopped right there. And so um, in dreaming the dream forward, she, she basically had a freeze response, like she couldn't speak. And uh, in, in dreaming the dream forward, it was, it was um, what she did was she stood up and she spoke and she just said, I have nothing to tell you. And something as simple as that. And then, um, and then she's had a subsequent dream where somebody came and she had children in her care and someone came and uh, 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 took her away, which I believe is what actually happened. But um, after that, she, she never had that dream again. She'd had it for years. She'd had it for um, frequently for years. It was her biggest complaint. Mm -hmm. And simply letting it carry forward um, stopped, stopped that dream. It's a, it doesn't always work quite as beautifully as that, but it will always change the dream. And this is what happens in, in, in um, naturally in, in dreaming and nightmares, even with Holocaust survivors, there's been a study of dreaming of Holocaust survivors. So the worst trauma you could imagine, their dreams start to shift from what really happened to starting to have some uh, temporal anomalies, things like what happened yesterday and current characters and some feelings of hope infiltrate. And you can say that that is a, a, a trauma that is be being integrated and the dreaming actually shows you it. And so you can engender that process by starting to weave in some current events, some something that, you know, you can have them imagine it forward and let it just, it doesn't have to be what really happened next. It's just where the dream wants to go next. Mm -hmm. And the more, I feel like the more richly experience, experience it is, the more effective it is at um, seeding the following steps of the dream so that when it comes back, the dream actually has an avenue to go. And that's why I think it changes because rather than get, getting stopped and woken up in the most frightening place, the dream uh, sort of has a, it's, it's got a path that's been mm -hmm. created and it carries on. And when the person says that the dream has stopped, I think it doesn't stop. I think it keeps doing its job, but they don't wake up in that point. And maybe they don't wake up till morning. And so they may have had the dream, but they don't have any recollection of it. And over time, then that particular trauma experience becomes a memory as opposed to something really current. Yeah, that is so interesting and really helpful. And one of the things I really like in the way that you're describing it is the way that you're working, you're not confined to the dream as it happened. You're, yes. uh, you're allowing yourself to bring in other kind of imagination and what you just said there, it sounds almost like you're looking for, it's like the dream keeps, if it's a nightmare, the dream keeps waking the dreamer up at the worst possible moment in a way. And if you can imagine anything that would carry the dream forward, it's like you're providing a symbolization of further experiencing. And there's many different ways of doing that that will help the experience go at least a little bit further forward and you get beyond that worst part and then other things can start coming into the dream. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, very much. And sometimes the dreams, um, you know, they, they, the, the whole tenor of them shifts mm -hmm. so that something that was nightmarish um, becomes a lot friendlier and yeah. it creates a um, less of, a, of a, an aversion to the memory. It makes it possible to work with the memory if you want to, although dreaming can also um, provide images. Uh, over time, the, the dreams become less replicative and more metaphorical, generally speaking. I mean, there's never a hard and fast rule with dreams, but um, but then, you know, sometimes the dreams will just, they'll bring pictures of the feeling and you can uh, work with the pictures, have them carry forward, um, maybe draw them, maybe, you know, get familiar with them, let them have a, a, a voice and a life. Um, and that can be a way of working with the trauma, the feelings around it without ever having to retell the story. And sometimes the story isn't even available. 
but the dreaming is helping with the with the emotion that that that's carried with it and i think that's one of the things that dreams do actually what they're trying to do and that night recurrent nightmares are mm. just when the process gets stalled out because of the intensity of the the physiological intensity wakes the person up and the dreams don't get to do their job but there's such a um, um profound shift that happens if you work this way it seems easier to me than working um specifically with trauma events i feel like that's fraught sometimes with mm. you know it, it it's it, it's like the i think the dreams are actually trying to help with yeah. trauma and teaching us how to be with be with the experiences yeah definitely um I have another question. No, we don't have too much more time. Um, <clears throat> it's a specific question and a bigger question at once. And the specific question is on, I remember many years ago when I read Jendlin's um, Let Your Body Interpret Your Dreams. I've got his book here and also your book, which I think is a wonderful book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I really loved it because it also gives more context around dreams and dream research and stuff, which I really enjoyed. But <clears throat> when Gene talks about the bias control, and it's a little bit complex how to understand what he really means by that from his book. And I'm wondering about your understanding of the bias control or anything else that you feel could kind of be updated since his original dream book so many years ago. Hmm. Yeah. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, the bias control, you know, I mean, he did add that paper after his dream book, three learnings since the dream book. And because he realized that the way he described bias control in the original book was very convoluted and difficult to understand. And so he basically revised it himself to say, you know, any time that the dreamer and the dream disagree, to pay attention to that. And I do think there is something um, for me in that, that, that has, I've learned from and has evolved. And so I think it's really good to be contrarian in dream work and to look at the whole dream scenario and say you have a you know a monster in the dream and you your initial response is well there's there's the bad guy and and it's like one of those detective movies where the bad guy's never the bad guy it's always the you know something that you don't expect and dreams are like that i think it's a, a mistake to um to decide too early or even ever actually what's good what's bad i don't think of dreams in those terms and so, but the bias control, it's a way of, uh, if we're working in our, uh, with our own dreams, it's the idea is that we'll, we'll basically interpret it in ways that we'll already, we already know what it means. Yeah. And we presume um, a lot of things. And so this is taking, taking that idea completely away and looking at the dream um, as if it's a completely different world and we know nothing about, and we can't presume anything about anything. But it's often more enlarging and more um, interesting, uh, expansive to go toward the things in the dream that we initially have a, um, an aversion to. That's how I, you know, kind of revised the, the way to talk about bias control. So the, I might start with what's, what's helpful and what feels good to, you know, um, get the help and resources. But always I'm interested in, you know, <clears throat> the, the um, darker, mysterious corners of the dream, because I feel like those are our growing edges. They're not necessarily bad. Honestly, mm -hmm. they're often where the greatest source of growth comes from, but there will be an initial, I don't know, that comes with every dream anyway, the whole dream often people have this, I don't know, that means nothing. I'm gonna just, you know, I already know what it means. Those are all ways <laughs> to avoid it. And then within the dream, it's a, um, a, a way of just being like, I really don't know anything about anything here. This is a world unto itself. And what looks very, very frightening might actually be my greatest ally and to never presume. Um, and so, but going toward the things that have an, an edge is usually where the most growth happens. Yeah. And so that's how I, how I um, I've sort of describe bias control 
And with the other, the other main thing, and there's, there's many things that I would have updated about um, Jenlin's work, but the other one is the 16 questions. He's like a list of 16 questions that he suggests you ask of a dream. And he takes most of them from Jung, Freud, and uh, Gestalt. Uh, and they are basically an interrogation process of the dream. And I don't agree with that approach. I feel like there are questions to hold, and I've picked up the the three experiential questions. Can you be that person? Um, can the dream continue? Um, there's one more, I, I, the finding help. And those ones, uh, finding help isn't one of the 16 questions, but those are the ones I feel like are the most open-ended and generative. And the other ones, like, oh, what has it got to do with your childhood or sexuality? Or I think those those things will arise naturally if that's what's in the dream. But to specifically be um, interrogating the dream in those ways, I feel like that's a mistake or it delimits it. Yeah. So I, I kind of caution the use of those 16 questions. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask just one very quick question just for my own interest um i have dreams i mean I, I i remember my dreams sometimes and then sometimes i don't and if i have clients that don't i encourage them to have a, a notepad by the bedside table and try to jot down just anything and mm -hmm. it, it dreams usually come quite quickly which surprises me um, but i have a dream that um there's different aspects of the dream, but the thing that I find so interesting that I've never been able to quite understand is just that it's like there's this place in my dream world that doesn't exist in the physical world, but it's almost like another world. And there's this particular house that I find over and over again in my dreams and it's it's it like all sorts of different like the dream activity is is something else like there's you know my i've lost yeah. my dog or you know whatever's happened but it's this funny it's like a street or a house or something and i in the dream i always have this same reaction it's like oh i'm back here <laughs> like i recognize it as a familiar place and i'm always curious about that why i have made for myself if if i think of it that way this alternative familiar sense of home sort of in in the shape of a house in my dream does that make any sense to you <laughs> it does yeah i have a place like that in my dream world as well yeah it's more uh, um yeah a, 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 a landscape it's more outdoors but um mm -hmm. i recognize the place when i go back to it mm -hmm. and i feel like you know i i do think the dream world is its own world and i think it has places that exist that we can visit uh how that works i mean some people suggest oh you know that is another parallel life we're living or um that it's um it's a real world that is on a different plane or there's you know there's many ways that people uh, try to make sense of it I, I can't say that i know i think that's one of the things about dreams i love is this is part of the mystery, mm -hmm. but it can be one of the one of the things that you can do if you have the awareness that you're dreaming is to ask, you know, what is this place when you're there? Mm -hmm. And it's a it's, a, it's a, an avenue to becoming lucid in your dreams. If you have a place that or an event or a thing that comes up often to mm -hmm. just as you're as you're sleeping or going to sleep to see the idea that when I come to this house, I'm going to realize it's a dream. And then you can maybe from within the dream ask, you know, what is this place and see what it says, because that will probably be more telling than anything I could say about it. <laughs> but I, I do have that experience as well. And I, and I do love that there's this familiar place I visit and what it is, mm -hmm. is yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah, I love it too. And it, it, it certainly feels like another world that has particular places that continue even when i'm not there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i can go back to and there they are again you know yeah but they might have evolved or you know years might have passed or something yeah, exactly. yeah 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 it, it is fascinating i don't know what to say beyond that 
Well, mm-hmm. it's I feel I feel inspired by a lot of what you've said, and it makes me um, interested in my dreams all over again. I'm just curious as we come to the end, if there's anything you would like to add, anything else that we didn't touch upon or. No, I think your questions were um, excellent and and covered all of the the main things I would have said, but in a a really nice way, a nice flow. Um, I just want to say, you know, to everybody who's who's listening to this, that, you know, really, I just encourage you to turn toward your dreams because they'll enlarge your uh, um, consciousness and enrich your life. And there's a tendency to dismiss them and to think of them as nonsensical and, and silly. And, and they're just, they're just not. And so I'm hoping that um, people will be encouraged to, you know, just to experience their dreams more deeply and, and get the, um, the richness that comes from them. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I really, really appreciate talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me on this uh, series of conversations. I appreciate, I really just appreciate being able to to, to talk with you and uh, spread the word. Yeah, terrific. Thanks mm. very much. Okay, thanks, Greg. Okay. Yeah, bye, bye for now. Yeah. Bye.